Hello everyone, today we talk about the transformation from the Germanic comitatus to feudal chivalry. Uh, this is a very wide, uh, complex and complicated topic that is also difficult to define, for example, in the way I've just uh, done it. Um, and that, yet, I've, I've tried to, to, to discuss now from some time, and I think I, I will have to talk really a lot uh, about it again. You know, I always think that what I'm doing here, albeit I've made something like 460 videos, is still kind of warm enough. <laughs> Meaning that if I, uh, I'm i going to have enough time, I will really cover all this stuff in, in, in ultra detail, making tons of other videos about these topics, um, step by step. And um, I began to explore from some time, therefore, this idea of, you know, exploring the roots of medieval chivalry, that is a topic that definitely fascinates everyone who is interested in medieval history or in medieval warfare, um, uh, as we are on Schwerpunkt. And, and trying to give some answers that um, I think generally people need. I mean, the, 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 there is much questioning about these things, there, are, there is much of this kind of even broader cultural interests referring to this phenomenon. I mean, why is that the chivalry was born, for example? Uh, what did influence it? And there are naturally uh, several, you know, theories. Like, uh, it's obvious that at this point it's not a matter, they're not mutually exclusive. Exclusive. We know that medieval chivalry is, uh, you know, a quite big thing. It was the process of many other big things that went intertwined, intersected each other. And that yet can f can uh, be described with a you know a, a kind of shared pattern, um, and today discussing this topic in particular, I think we are gonna look at chiefly what the uh, uh, ancient Gefolschaft uh, Comitatus or this basically uh, retinues of the um, European chieftains of the. Iron Age uh, had been about, um, and th and 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 also before, meaning that these were f political and social and military uh, associational forms that, as you know, are very very ancient. Um, you can interpret definitely medieval chivalry as not really um, something that was uh, brought from the external. This is um, an hypothesis uh, or a theory that uh, I've heard stressed many times naturally uh, this puts me on controversial on a controversial plan at least for someone because as soon as you discuss the fact you know wh where did something come from and people get triggered by either you know you know but, but every kind of like cultural appropriationists or you know nationalists or 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 let's say um other um people were i suspect not very interested in history proper because history is this continual uh, research to really understand what, uh, what what things are in the base of evidence really not on making a narrative for the sake of it at least it's obvious that we need a narrative to tell history but um, I, I think I've proven at, at this point point that I, I think I'm you know it's evident that I'm definitely at least not moved by particular aims or agendas. I, I really don't give a damn. I just like history sometimes just like an amateur even though there are pa sheets of paper that, that tell that I'm kind of some some uh, reliable uh, um, you know uh, figure for, for speaking about these things but it's not really so because really even if you if you have a title or something that, that doesn't make you expert about the whole thing. So telling the truth um, I'm learning much uh, together with you by making these videos about these topics and I wa just want to share w what I think about it because that that's the idea as you know it, I, I don't have a cathedratic role on Schwerpunkt this is really open and it's a very horizontal um, scope the, the one I have always bearing in mind though that um, it's evident that there are problems in telling history and in telling it in a way that um, first of all is understood Secondly, that is um, broadly expand. I mean, comprehended um, deeply. Like you know, if, if I s make a statement, man, man, many people I think start watching my videos because they presume that I that I wink at, at them in some ways. Like you know, from, from what team they support or what kind of ideas they have. I 
I frankly don't give a damn. And if you think that Schwerpunkt is about this, you know, you can get away immediately because, frankly, this is not for you. Um, but I know that my followers are actually people that, you know, have at this point understood what the what what the thing is uh, about Schwerpunkt and uh, I appreciate them for this. So what I would like to discuss um, about this topic now is, um, and I was actually trying to complete the sentence, is really the properly European roots of chivalry, right? You know, th th there are these options that say, well, you know, there was this influence, for example, from the East, you know, if you look at the, the cataphracts, the, the, per the Persian East, etc., or even the uh, the Arab invasions that brought some, brought some forms of chivalry that were developed in there, and especially also when they, when the um, caliphal world was um, permeated, let's say now with the uh, Turkish, uh, um, Turkish, uh, Turkic influence, uh, and um, you know that that brought something you know f from the far steps. But this is really th the point about the stories that after all Europe does come from steps I mean uh, largely the what what is defined as Indo-European or Caucasian whatever you want to call it is really coming from there and it's coming largely culturally from there meaning that um, whatever you know the the ethnic ratios of these populations were and how they mixed indeed uh, the the impact that the the Indo-Aryan culture had in the mythology in the culture etc was pretty heavy, and when we talk about um, uh, chivalry, we sh we always have to to bear it in mind, right? Because as long as we talk about cavalry, that's a different thing, right? Cavalry is really a technical thing. And indeed, uh, Western Europeans didn't basically develop a great deal of cavalry um, before the 8th century AD. Uh, and they did take a lot, even in terms of, you know, know-how, zootechnic knowledge um, and, uh, and, and in other uh, traditions from, from other groups also often coming from the steppes and from that direction really what what made the greatest influence was not the you know the 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 east or the south but it was really the steppe proper right you know these waves of peoples just think about the early middle ages of populations like the huns or the avars or the bulgars or or the or the um, majors you know those were really important even for defining certain things it's important for example in the development of color engine cavalry etc even just in order i mean i'm not um really talking about a mutual um you know um in terms of that they had to teach something that these populations had to teach something um in order to to trigger this but just the fact of needing to counter them in some measure however absorbing them and and um and and having those elements that influence that world um, uh, were important. And if you really, if we really think about it, really, the even not even the European identity in this sense is very different from a military point of view in the origin from those other cultures. Meaning that coming from the steppes, everybody who studies the steppes knows that in spite of the big differences that do exist ethnically, linguistically, etc. Basically, this world was pretty damn homogeneous. I mean, if you look at I don't know, uh, the early medieval armor from the Pannonian plains to to the Bering Strait, what you see is basically the same freaking identical equipment, right? For thousands and thousands of kilometers of steps, right? And this is so evident and uh, and abs macroscopically known now, stereographically speaking, that there is no doubt that really what when we talk about cavalry and chivalry um, in the medieval high medieval context we're talking about massive influences that came exactly from the east in that sense but was what was the east at this point and 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 um, you know who was who compared to this because w the point I'm, I'm i've been trying to guess also I've made some videos on the origins of of, of medieval um, chivalry is in fact the the fact that the Europeans also came from the East, and this is something that um, uh, back in the day, you know, in the, the first millennium uh, before Christ, um, the uh, the point is about, you know, Europeans maintained even after they settled uh, far and wide into Western Europe, into Northern Europe, into Southern Europe, wherever. Um, uh, during migrations, they did maintain actually uh, um, uh, even. And therefore, I mean, sedentarizing and losing 
the original um, zootechnic capabilities and becoming essentially um, societies of infantrymen rather than cavalrymen, uh, if anything by, by matters of number, they maintained quite strongly and quite deeply in their memory, in their mythical past, the uh, I, I would say the obsession, but it's excessive, but it, it kind of partly gets to the point because also religiously speaking, that is very important to understand. Um, to understand, for example, the military ethos and all this stuff of cavalry, right? The idea that the freeman was fundamentally a cavalryman and a um, a warrior and a, a commander of men, right? And, and on this, you can read oceans of ink, uh, ink that have been written forever, like uh, this is a very big topic and invests uh, a huge amount of, of fields, as you understand, not just history, but archaeology, anthropology, uh, ethnology, um, history of religions. It, it's, it's really a massive thing, so that's why there is so much to discuss about it. Um, the, the interesting part of the story, in my opinion, is from, from one side assessing the fact that, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, this... Um, let's say Eastern influence never really came apart, right? And, and that uh, Europe objectively in this doesn't quite have a real frontier. And, and this, is, this historically speaking has made a very big difference in terms of also how the local populations developed and how they also their military traditions were about. Um, and that's what we're largely covering on Schwerpunkt. But also, and, and from a more strictly Western perspective, in, in the continent, how the w there was still a basically a memory of this past and a continuity in the military traditions on this base, and how when we talk about medieval chivalry, it is something that that emerges together with feudalism. It was something fundamentally new to Europe, uh, for for real at that point. We see that much of this, all of this. Um, more or less, I would say, less forgotten past, um, poured in once again to basically fill the uh, the ideological, the ideal structures of feudalism in, into what we know as chivalric or car courtly or whatever you want to call it, culture, right? Um, and today I would like to talk about the North, right? You know, I, I, I on Schwerpunkt we haven't discussed it enormously about um, Medieval Scandinavia, etc. We will have to cover it, uh, um, starting in part also from videos like this. And so, if this north that uh, at this point has not really much of geographical, uh, at least strictly speaking, meaning that of course, if we're talking about the Viking Age, we more or less have an idea of what we're talking about. But really, the point I would like to make is that Europeans shared at this point especially after the migration era, uh, but don't think that before it was that different, telling the truth. This um, common, um, let's say, uh, models of, 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 of politics, of, of power, of military traditions, that were all in dialogue, one with each other, right? It's obvious that there were many differences within the same European continent, but at the end of the day, um, if you even consider what, what what early medieval Europe was really about in terms of, you know, development and economy, you know, it was pretty pretty homogeneous, right? It was a largely, Europe was still largely a depressed area in Eurasia, right? You know, it, it wasn't this enormously developed place. It was yet to, to expand in that sense and to grow, which would start to do it. And incidentally, feudal Europe is exactly uh, how the, the process, I mean, it's development how the process happened, really. Um, so it's very interesting to look at even these areas of, of, of Europe and to realize how they all transformed in a way or another. So naturally, the broader frame of what we're talking about today, today we'll talk about strictly Northern Europe uh, at this point, but always to consider what the context uh, here it is. Fundamentally, we will take a look to, I think, not before nor uh, later than, if not maybe for something about the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, um, about the uh, 12th and, and th even 13th century uh, Scandinavia.
right? So a world that at this point is being on the on quite a you know from fr quite a time of a consistent path of um, what you can call Frankization and together with uh, Christianization, right? So this is a, a, a moment in history where basically um, the core land of, of the Franks uh, has managed to export uh, what we call let's say vassalatic beneficiary system if we want to be proper but you know largely can be also about feudalism proper as a form of um, really of, of political and social control um, in some ways and, and that was making Europe expanding on the base of this uh, on this same structure right um, the, the the 12th the 13th centuries are the moments of, of enormous expansion of the European continent at rates that frankly uh, you don't find very much el anywhere else you know at, at this point and that that is amazing especially northern Europe right because southern Europe was obviously more advanced than northern Europe but um, northern Europe I in proportion in relative terms was expanding way faster so you have this uh, sometimes very uh, let's say radical changes for the time and, and culture that in the north however in the far north that we're, we're observing here are um, kind of slow right not much because they weren't important for for them actually they were probably much um, you know uh, more uh, modifying changes than they were for other areas of Europe like from the same core land of the Franks you, it's not that in proportion so much had changed for for the far north this was really a big change right it was um, it was slow it was progressive uh, also in there that there weren't so many resources to be invested and to 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 grow as fast as w southwestern Europe let's say but it, it started happening there and wh what you have is this, this late process of Frankization in in the military systems in the structures the development of kingdoms on this um, larger military retinues, the stratification of society that incidentally occurred also with the loss and freedom of the freemen uh, in this world that instead from the zip had stressed very much the idea that more or less all freemen were were such meaning that yeah that they were kind of more powerful freemen but theoretically everybody had the same rights feudalism as you know uh, kind of disrupts the system and, uh, and it's a controversial topic because many people say oh well it was well before there was a, you know, not really I mean it really depends on what we're talking about and we can't hide that you know that the feudal Europe expanded pretty fast and and, and you know in the moment in which it, you the continent was feudalized objectively was rising uh, in, in an at an unprecedented rate objectively so wh whichever the results were at a you know at a social level th still the the whole system improved right and it's partly from from, from what we, we come at the end of the day because you know after all we l still live in a moment that um, in history that uh, was uh, built on models that were refusing the ancien regime that was kind of founded at the time but at the same time was uh, still developing on, on the base of its achievements I mean we would have not had the um, bourgeois um, liberal revolutions of the 18th century if um, those uh, classes for example hadn't developed economically speaking previously and under the structures of the certain kingdoms that br let's say broadly speaking originated uh, at this point so this is the context a little bit um, naturally um, there is also the process of Christianization that we named before that is never to be forgotten I made some videos about this um, telling the history of Christianization especially of the far north as something telling the truth way less dramatic that is often liked to be told um, at least in certain environments um, and this has nothing to do with would or it shouldn't have hopefully nothing to do with what you think um, about uh, spiritually let's say um, but it's also very important to to frame because this process even in the transformation in of uh, 
let's say, um, of these societies from tribal to feudal ones um, do does pass through certain cultural perceptions and continuities that can be found uh, even between paganism and Christianity, right? You know, just think about, and this is what chivalry is also importantly about, because one thing is understanding naturally the fact that the feudal system can produce this ultra elite of heavily armored uh, cavalry with, with the you know the highest collective training ever seen at a cavalry level uh, at that point um, that that becomes a political as well as a military elite and and you you understand this this very structural reason right but this went along with with other processes that that were instead very ideal, right? You know, and and and, and yet there are continuities, right? The the, the idea even the, of the um, of warfare proper and how it passes, it transitions from paganism to to Christianity, that were both legitimizing violence in some form, at least uh, in, in this real societies, because eventually, you know, the, the, that things are way more complicated on in terms of the interpretation of religions, etc. But um, as you know, here that there is a, uh, a transition from Vikings that are pagans and go raiding um, overseas um, to Crusaders, Scandinavian Crusaders, also going to the Near East, and and and, and you can't say you know where's the, the really the the, the the sharp division between the two moments. Actually, there is not right, and you can't tell the history of Christianization. Um, as you know uh, a brutal uh, oppressive transition that it basically and especially in the far north wasn't really perceived as such or uh, and this is proved if anything by the fact that the development of scandinavian monarchies was something extremely complicated uh very uh, they, they were essentially weak monarchies up, up to the end of the middle ages and they weren't able to impose this different hierarchies in which also the church had you know uh, were was part structurally a very strong power a very strong and also sometimes al also militarized power because actually the episcopates etc were or the, the 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 abbots etc were in the frankish world largely uh military men up to a certain point at least and so this is very um it's a very wide topic but just to make you understand that that things are I, i'm making these videos on schwerpunk because i realized that people out there have completely lost the plot about these topics right you know it's not become uh, a matter of saying you know let's study history for for what we already know it is because we have written a, a, a massive amount of of, of books on, on these topics no it's about my tiny you know backyard and what i i, I presume i can imagine to be true right that that is this is the logic that stays behind but it, it it's it's wrong right so i would like you know the third millennium to to start a bit with <laughs> you know in my hopes with with something a bit deeper than that because otherwise we have we have thrown away thousands of years of civilization uh so aside from this um you know that there is this world of the the zippe the the comitatus also in here there is a, a great transition that we can't talk about but essentially um there is a transformation that starts since the the ancient world uh, in 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 the so-called Germanic world, uh, that is fundamentally this transition from the ideal. It's very ideal. There, there is nothing strictly temporal or uh, geographical into this, but it, the, 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 there are tendencies and orientations in this sense of the zippe. So fundamentally, the village, right? The family, actually, because that's what zippe basically means. But the idea of of a sedentarized life it was fundamentally more or less peaceful and um, an egalitarian, um, everybody had the same rights, it was a kind of a... And then the comitatus, that is instead the, the military uh, associationism in some ways. That is based on, on conquer, on plunder. And telling the truth, um, the, the two things have always been kind of connected. This is not really a northern thing either. This is something you find basically and literally everywhere in Europe uh, at different ages. Like oh, the, the wind, you find the Indo-European migrations, you find everywhere in Europe from the Alans or um, or the Celts, the Italics, the, the Lusitanians. So you find the same thing. You basically, these communities that settle down, 
they have still this fundamental semi-nomadic uh, past in mind in a tribal, highly militarized society that um, that was used to send out every every once in a while, usually every year, theoretically at least. But the point is, where really the local resources were were not um, sufficient to to feed everyone to send out the young men, you know, the the the, the, the yeah, the, the young uh, men to 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 search that there were warriors, right? They were initiated with, with this to go conquer someone else's land, right? Or and either founding basically a new a new tribe a new uh, group um, uh, with often ma you know uh, mating with the uh, with the conquered women where the, the, the of that com those communities that were uh, whose men had been slaughtered it's full of this everywhere in, in all indo-european mythology in the history of rome in it's it's literally everywhere um or to die in the, in the endeavor obviously so uh, and you understand it this is very crude like this this is really uh it was a necessity it was a necessity in those worlds where the local resources in fact were were not um sufficient to sustain larger bodies of of the men and and you realize that naturally northern and eastern europe this this remained like this for a very very long time like s the southwestern europeans developed in ways that were naturally able to to pass to, to to go through a phase of civilization of development of of organization of certification of of structuration a hierarchization that could rationalize all this process and to pacify um together with controlling so the the myth of the free north is just rubbish um those societies were continuously compromised by endemic warfare right um and they they hadn't any way to to live like that i mean they didn't have the uh the, the r local resources in order to maintain something larger than a village start things things start to change during the migration era um even in those lands that were not romanized the, the borders of the roman empire actu are actually a pretty damn uh, accurate indicator of of where that specific you know society ended right and 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 the sedentary one uh started to, to, to was was um you know um available but was was supportable i don't know how to say that um but um so if you wonder why pe people's like the germans for example were so highly militarized it's because they were at that level there were still tribes fundamentally and they 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 couldn't live in different ways uh this is showed even with the so-called viking era you know the the idea that for whichever reason we think climate warming brought the scandinavians at a certain point to make more children but not to have enough or be better not to make more children but to make th for chil their children to survive more likely because temperatures were higher uh than the usual that they didn't have though what what to feed them with locally because scandinavia didn't quite allow much of an expansion so that's why so many of them take the seas uh, this is actually a very approximate uh reason that there are many other reasons we will have to make lots of videos on the reason the causes of viking let's say so-called viking uh, expansion which was not just piracy or uh, or plunder but th it was also colonization proper um, that is also bringing chunks of population to live elsewhere right uh, and, and that's how incidentally they, they arrived to America and the other stuff but and th that's why they, w they went so far and wide right so uh, this is if you want a cycle that you find not just among the Europeans it's really common to every kind of tribal society that that's a kind of a st I know anthropologists will hate me for this but it's as if it was a stage to make it simple to make it deductive it was a stage of civilization and incidentally also corresponds to certain beliefs I mean to certain views of the world etc so um, it's it's interesting because I realized there are also a lot of people interested in paganism and this phenomenon you know wh why were these societies in this way why they transition to Christianity how the process happened and all this what the today are kind of i don't know i mean i know why but you know they're considered in a silly way controversial topics right that instead historiography has long explored 
right? And there is nothing strange about it. We, we, we should be free to talk about it. Um, but th they're complex, right? So they're often narrowed down to very simplistic, you know, uh, ideas, often, often ideologically oriented. That's where dangers and that's what you should be aware of what you, what you say, right? Um, but the, <laughs> let's say, the, the tri these tribal societies, as we've seen, during the migration era, for example, it, the, the transition between from the zip to the comitatus is very much felt, naturally, because there is this, for whichever reason it was, there is this putting in motion of the system, right? These populations that started to, um, to squander the system, the pushing against each other, uh, that they, they needed new lands to leave because, uh, you know, there was either some sort of crisis we can't, difficultly pictured there were other peoples pushing them uh, away so they needed to put themselves on the march and this causes unavoidably the, the militarization of society right because uh, we see it even at a political level that the, the Germanic peoples uh, were pretty distrustful to towards any form of elite because they could afford not having elite because they were fairly primitive and poor to not to make uh, one of the freemen prevailing and and for example the whole uh, religion they had was based exactly on this i mean it wasn't actually based on a belief as as we intended for example in monotheistic perspective it was it was a, a much more um uh, it's difficult to explain it but let's uh, stick into the political side of the story let's say that, that this this religions were were essentially a social control Right, so a po social political control. That is to say, that you have to pass, even as a chieftain, through the um, through the um, divine test that is test. Let's say that, that is um, performed in some ways by the sacerdotal uh, sacerdotal, let's say, class, or at least by individuals that are uh, conceived uh, as essentially arbiters and guardians of of freedom like that you can find this also in Mesopotamia for example you know the, the high priest sometimes had the, the, uh, had this duty of expelling the king uh, ritually and to reaccept him in this form of you know making always understand um, that that he was a man you know he was a mortal so th this was very important at the time very very important at the time and and this is even if they hadn't rationalized it, but it was basically the way they used to control society so that no no uh, excessive power could prevail. With the comitatus, the situation gets, um, f with the migration era, this, this gets pretty messed up, right? And, and uh, for many reasons. The first one is naturally that many Germanic populations went to put themselves on the march, uh, first of all, so they elect uh, princes or chieftains or kings or whatever you want to call them that are theoretically just military leaders that once the migration was over, they had theoretically to, you know, to come back to, to what they had been before, always given that there had always been aristocracies in this world in spite of all, but still the equilibrium, the balance was, was pushed by these same aristocracies so that nobody could prevail. Um, Many of them also settle into southwestern Europe, so in, in regions where f also both for um, demographic um, dynamics and for um, the, the you know the the, the rich the, the well let's say the richness the wealth of the uh, of the land had to basically be assimilated by those other systems like um, so that you can have kingdoms proper in southwestern Europe. Uh, while you know that takes a freaking lot of time to develop elsewhere in in the, in the lands of origins in the north etc and we're talking about here really different scales of power because you can find things like kings like everywhere you know even you know the Ariovistus that comes into uh, Celtic Gaul at the s incidentally the same time Caesar is invading it was named Rex by in Latin by Caesar but you know that's Rex in a that would be interesting to comment but these were chieftains really not not really you know they didn't have huge kingdoms structured power uh, it was absolutely impossible right but I guess you know this but it, it, it's also important to, to to remind certain things to 
to make you better understand wh what change effectively. In the comitatus and the migration era brings this idea that, uh, you know, in times of trouble, you do need harsh, harsher measures. Like, it's like the martial law, right? Um, nobody really, even in our societies that are highly democratic, but still the idea is that, for example, if there is a war, so there is a state of emergency, so the, the, the military takes over, right? You know, it's still the politic policy doing so, but there are measures that basically into which individual rights are suspended because you say, you know, the, 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 the way we, we let's say, uh, we would deal individually with the situation would, would not be uh, functional to, to, to a more centralized direction that obviously needs a, a unity of command and all, and this is valid for every society, and that's why the mil in the military you have essentially to obey orders, otherwise you're under, you know, you, you get, uh, you know, sentenced uh, un under martial law because you put at risk the, the whole group rather than, you know, trying to make something that you think is important. I mean, hierarchies are needed in times of trouble. Uh, hierarchies are what ensures order, right? This comes at a cost, though, and, and these populations knew it, but as you know, the migration era was a pretty devastating moment, and therefore, lots, uh, really, a lot of things change. A lot of things change. Um, the far north had remained relatively uh, at the at the outskirts of 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 this world. I mean, obviously, there was a great deal of connections also with Scandinavia and the Roman Empire. Um, it, it's widely known there were. German warriors basically making a living into the Roman army to even, you know, after they had finished the, the service to come back in Denmark or you know, other, whatever they came from, basically. And to be extremely proud, by the way, of having fought for Rome. Um, so, as you see here, a huge premise just to, to, to get certain things right in the first place. And in the far north, um, it's really the Viking Age that, that changes a lot of things because up to that time, as you know, there had been waves of uh, you know what you call can call Vikings, ideally speaking. I mean, take the Anglo-Saxon uh, invasions uh, since the the, the second, the third century on the British shores under the Roman uh, rule. You know that that that, that had been it. I mean, the, 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 it's not that the Vikings were an invention or that it never happened before, but what happens during Viking Age is, is is something much more accelerated, much more intense, right? And this brings basically to the disgregation of the zippe and the idea that is that the comitatus that takes over. Incidentally, the complete opposite thing that you see, for example, in Vikings that I hate uh, as a show because it's so. I mean, I I think it's I hate it because I don't think it's artistically uh, qualitative in the first place. But secondly, also there are this points like you know wh why is that you know you have to show a world where you you pretend that you know these were free uh romers that uh, the, that just wanted to escape the tight grip of, of the authority no it was the other way around pre uh, viking scandinavia was a place where people were fundamentally you know largely free in the way you know that those times could really be and during Scandinavian, t uh, excuse me, vi Viking times, you have instead the massive stratification of society under this political and mil military elites that made a freaking lot of money with trade and piracy and conquest overseas, and they came back to Scandinavia to build kingdoms, right? And that is to basically oppress uh, uh, the, the, their, the, 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 the freemanship, I don't know how you want to call it, um, under the and to frame it under a, a more structural control where, where this is more advanced is um, the Jutland Peninsula is Denmark that naturally was the, the most developed place also the one that resembled the most and that got Frankicized the most got Christianized earlier so we're because the local resources allowed it right and the the, the, the you know the, this this can let's say the, the Viking raids were a way to accumulate wealth literally taking it from somewhere and bringing it back home 
where you could pay military retinues, etc. And you could form a power around your wealth and to structure something and to build s s very slowly what, what we think w will become kingdoms and later states and all you know this stuff. So it really starts at this point. Um, and, and that's where you have, however, also the transformation between the comitatus and, and this and, and chivalry, if you want, or the feudal elite, right? That is a further change. Why is it a further change? Because theoretically the comitatus was, as we've seen before, uh, not really in opposition to the previous asset. Like, it was normal in, in the Germanic world to have the village, let's say, the community, this, the, the sedentary community, and then these troops, that excuse me, this, um, these warriors, let's put it in this way, um, that were different from the other warriors. You know that your every freeman was ideally a warrior in in, in the in these societies. But there were individuals that basically started living at the outskirts of these societies. Um, it, now it, it's also very complicated to expand it once again. So if I start digressing in every single word I say, we will never get to the point. But it, I, I think I already know what what we're talking about. I mean, these were troops, in fact, that that had to go out there to survive, either because they, they were uh, ostracized or because they, they, they had a, a pulsion for it, they had taste for, for loot, blood or adventure, whatever, and therefore making up for this military, let's say, making up these military units that were slowly evolving into something very close to, to, to mercenaries by the end of the day, or at least of troops that were um, of units more proper, that were bands, that, that were held together by a code, uh, a warrior ethics based on brotherhood or honor and loyalty that were in a nutshell what the, the old uh, ideal in the European thing what had been about in the, the tribal society. It was preserved, but it was in this sense in the Comitatus put at the service of a life dedicated to that lifestyle, in fact, to, to war proper. Um, and, and this brought to, to several different outcomes sometimes, because this is what, what Vikings, for example, were about, largely if you consider what, uh, you know, the, 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 these expeditions were all um, under, a, uh, under some form of hierarchy and military organization that w they weren't just isolated pirates going around, you know, th there was much more than than the, the economical side of the story, it was really a political project, a social project that is incidentally what we we're s saying uh, before, evolved into kingship, right, in this um, in this direction so it's exactly this warrior ethics that had to evolve eventually in that sense that we define, in fact, as chivalric, right? Because uh, there are points in common. There are points in common uh, between the ancient Indo-European warrior and the medieval knight, right? Many points in common. They're not to be considered in opposition or as a form of, you know, of, 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 of um, sharp or ir irrecognizable transformation. They represent an evolution, they represent a continuity in so many ways. Many people are not willing to recognize this because they assume that what happened in the middle was a sort of shame of denial of their own culture. It, it, it's really not the point because it was those same people that decided to tr transition like that, especially in these contexts, right? Um, and, uh, in fact, okay, we could go deeper into this, but l l let's say that the, the, the transfer, the feu feudalization and Christianization of the far north, as a matter of fact, was a much more spontaneous and, and less mm, controversial, conflictual, dramatic thing that we can ever imagine, right? Not everything was Saxony. It was literally, you know, butchered down and re reorganized with a social engineering um, re reorganization that also that functioned, but also still didn't quite erase what what existed before. Uh, the rest was really uh, a matter of convenience, right? Think about the 
completely pacific Christianization of Iceland. Uh, and think just about the, the kingdoms that were developed in countries like Denmark or, or Norway or Sweden. I mean, they, these were things that were phenomena that happened because it was essentially the local aristocracy that wanted to build something greater over the others and this has always been the tendency there, there is even if you look at ancient world far before christianization or hints of it you see that the aristocracies always try to do that and and the reason why they they, they couldn't is that the base of those words were still fairly primitive they, they didn't allow enough surplus to be absorbed or I mean to be framed under the control of, a, of, of an oligarch in order to, to further expand and yet to find that as well I mean you do find that I don't know the Germans of the the, the, the first century BC were naturally very very different from the Germans of the second century AD as they were very very different from the ones of the sixth century AD there was a lot of change but the the Germans of the, 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 the Augustian age are basically entering uh, th they're still prehistory basically th th they are just entering in the Iron Age at that point I mean th it, they are at that primitive level right and, 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 and things evolve right slowly but they do evolve even into the lands of the so-called barbaricum where the Roman influence existed in many ways and did contribute in part to those changes but but hadn't intervened directly in order to to transform the whole thing so and you're, as you understand this this goes this is very long uh, range perspective right so this evolution was slow mm -hmm. and naturally as you can imagine it was different between people and people so it's very inconvenient in many ways to try to follow it from the sources because the sources are especially for certain, certain worlds they are dramatically uh, lacking documentation especially you you can find you know one statement popping every once in a while right or also a lot of as you know what we know about the Northmen etc is a product of um, already of Christianization of literacy, of um, of all of a society that has substantially changed. Okay, maybe not excessively. In fact, because that's where you can still can find the interesting references to to this past. It wasn't that far away from that point. They still responded to these more archaic models, but still in a way that has to um, to consider that you will find archaic elements that are summed with uh, in a syncretistic way with uh, influences of um, of uh, different cultures and an origin right so uh, it, it's it, in germanistic you know this is very difficult to to assess like w w this is the big question i mean w what 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 we know about the germans is it really something that uh, I, I don't know what Snorri Sturluson writes in the 13th century. Is, is really how it was before? Is, is you know how much of this has been filtered through other experiences, through other models, patterns, um, so and, and mindsets. So naturally, and we are lucky enough that we can partly trace this. So today, maybe we will not go in detail through through this, but we have partly already addressed this topic in other videos. Uh, for example, there is this video, uh, it's called something like the, the Religious Syncretism of the North, you can find, that in that case talks uh, incidentally about this voluntary Christianization of, the, of certain peoples from the same sagas, you know, that, that emerges even as a sort of a aware refusal to, of paganism in a military function. That, that, it, that, that video is particularly interesting because yeah, I, I advise you, I don't remember which saga that this was about, but it was Helgi, I think, Helgi's um, saga, um, in which you have basically a Scandinavian uh, warrior who willingly decides that uh, pagan religion doesn't work well for him, and as a m he becomes a true warrior, 
under Christian, with Christian faith, it was different from the pagan rite and the ritual dimension, and, the and you find this coexistence and continuity, even the, the exercise of, you know, the military edits and something between the, the, these two, re um, r religious backgrounds, you know, in their transition and intersections and, and syncretism. Also, at the end of the day, because this was not the product of of a day, uh, uh, it didn't happen overnight, as you understand. So, um, the if we were to f let's say to follow the path of the warrior warlike uh, Germanic society from the let's say barbaric comitatus to the uh, feudal chivalric age, um, we um, we we have to. We can, however, f mm, say follow it um, um, I as a linear and um, process in, in its c in its mm, general complex. Let's say it, it without doubt, uh, we would say because these weren't societies that transformed in a particularly. They were simple societies already since the beginning so the transitions were important for them proportionally but the, the the transformations didn't generate I don't know infinite outcomes I mean that the, there are there is a, a key of interpretation can serve didact didactically for this so uh, you can find for example um, this is something for example you can find in the what's um, Vatns della Saga. I, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, but it should be uh, the it basically it's, it's the saga of Vatnsdal, right? That shows this sort of typical pre-chivalric attitude through which certain Icelandic warriors were were preparing um, for for a military expeditions that had all the characters of the adventure right and so that has a lot to do even what medieval knight was conceptually about and that also was even um, uniting to it the to to the let's say to the common goals of these expeditions that were um, naturally the the enormous uh, let's say the, the enriching uh, the the expedition um, through loot and uh, and fighting, also a work of justice, like rendering justice to to someone, right? Because there is uh, in this expedition uh, a, a great booty that is made that is uh, taken away is, 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 uh, from the moradiers and by the pirates. Um, and this is interesting because these martyrs and pirates have stolen that wealth, in t had stolen that wealth in turn from peasants and merchants, right? So, really, it's, you know, as you know, in the Viking Age, it's very difficult to distinguish, for example, pirates from merchants because at the end of the day, they were the same persons. Uh, but there is a substantial difference between the martyrs and um, peasants, for example, they're they're two completely different lifestyles, and in this, um, that also in here in Scandinavian society, in partly coexisted, meaning that part of the same fr fr freemen that participated to the Viking expeditions, let's assume, could still you know be, um, for example, um, peasants like farmers. Um, in, in their normal life, uh, I made a video on the Leidang that that exposes that and that sees, for example, in the development of naval expeditions during the Viking Age, exactly this process of impoverishment of the freemen classes, the strengthening of the elites, and how this um, um, this um, naval expeditions were originally something very spontaneous and sometimes carried out, you know, very. Um, uh, in fact, sp spontaneously from from the same communities, and eventually towards the end of the Viking Age, you have instead that basically it's the the king that deals with this, that organizes this 
the even equips obviously the f the freemen or those who now were called f were issued by the crown to go to war to go to the expedition and weren't probably even completely fit and so as we see now we will look uh in a while in, in to the to the comitatus to the military retinue to the heart that we will define later that that develops as a as a military retinue of, of followers of military uh, of warriors uh, not differently from what the, the feudal the vassalatic retinues were on on the continent right uh, so you see here the feudal world expanding and the difference also between however d the in in the um, in the vats um, uh, into the Vatnsdal uh, saga you find however also the ideal right the, this justification the idea that you go make this military expedition that still has the taste of the of the raid of the brutal enterprise of the uh, if you want to even of the pagan um, ethos of the idea of wars as, as a as the way of of, of of the warrior, the freeman, right? Um, but you find in here something new. You find the concept that you're doing it for some sort of higher justice, right? Because when you take away loot from mortiers that had been stolen uh, from peasants, you are basically re-equilibrating, rebalancing the the thing there re-equilibrating society and therefore controlling society and, and bear in mind this is very specific because it, it's exactly how the seigniory, the, the vassalatic beneficiary system and feudalism are born because they're based on the concept that the Lord uh, needs to take from society in order to make justice and to pacify right so and and there is this task of pacification is very strong it's very strong it was perceived as a real need at the time and never underestimate the broader picture in here here the Europe is emerging from the second invasion so a lot of warfare going on so this as ne never think that for example you know when we think about Europe uh, conceptually in this kind of very approximated sometimes definitely wrong way aggressed from the external right like the Vikings the, the, the hungers the Saracens we often forget that those societies were were first of all deeply divided and conflictual among each other in the same exact way and and they were in, in, in many ways part of the same system so um, this saga shows for example that behind the, the, the let's say the edifying meaning and all but however the the need of let's say the sort of the mission of the warrior to accomplish something that goes beyond and th that's the concept of the knight at least ideally they think of all the effort to frame the um you know the the cadets the military uh the the, the second born sons of, of of the aristocracy into this kind of pious and religious in, uh, endeavor in order to, to, to protect the societas cristiana for example so it, it you can find here broader homes right of that and to have really a, a duty that goes beyond the, the military glory as it was perceived let's say banally and superficially uh, defined uh, um, as before right you know even before there were this kind of attitudes but that's the, the point of that's the idea is that that this is not just blind fury obviously the, the military instrument had always been used to justify a sort of order right um, to 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 uh, ensure the security right the, the righteousness of certain political and military actions so that was a good example. Um, there is also um, there is a lot, for example, about the Norwegian hirt. You know, the hirt was uh, in um, in uh, in this period in Scandinavian history, at least at the origins, an informal retinue 
of personal armed companions. They were known as hirtmen, in fact, or housecarls. Um, so uh, this, th this, this could be the equivalent of the Vassalatic Familia, right? Because housecarl simply means men of the house, right? And warrior of, of the house, right? So it's the same thing. And, and, and it came, in fact, to, to mean eventually as the, uh, over time, was restructuring of the Scandinavian uh, kingdoms, the nucleus of the guards of the royal army, right? So this um, sort of royal court or household, mm, and that was eventually codified legally speaking. This is the very interesting and important thing. So um, the the herd um, also, for example, in the Hirdskrat, that is the law that regulated these retinues, we can read the description of the oath to be sworn in order to enter into the comitatus of the Norwegian king in the Hird proper, right? Um, and um, some scholars have um, uh, evidenced how the Hird is really the supporting structure of this warrior associationism. It's and especially during the end of the Viking Age, during what is considered uh, or at least the Second Viking Age. So when these kingdoms are starting really to st to to structure and to produce uh, because of their surplus, this uh, regularly armed retinues that are also kind of professional troops. We're talking between the the tenth to the eleventh century, right? So. If we look at especially at the late juridical sources, we can spot into them, and with a certain degree of clarity, this relation only at the moment when it, it had entered in crisis, right? Because this is the moment when things are starting to be put in, written down proper. So we start having that, and so the system is already fading because there are now new relations, and the, the, the let's say. Uh, the, the, the kingdoms, the, the vassalatic structure is intensifying also on different bases, but it's evident that the the data o over which these um, sources are um, ha are are composed um, are are uh, are much are older, much older. So the herd is based on these two pillars of uh, brotherhood between the. The, the comrades, but also on mercenaries and proper towards the chieftain, right? This is something that uh, had existed since ever in the Germanic world, but in in in, in certain contexts, it, it, it you know it happened before, in other later, right? The the comitatus is something that Tacitus talks about, right? It was there. Uh, there were already these bands of. Of uh, of warriors that basically made a living as mercenaries, uh, and 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 the, the same Romans hired, incidentally, because even if there was a market of war. So this is important to find it in, in uh, to be found in the north during the 10th, 11th century, because that's incidentally the moment of the greatest um, um, enrichment. Of, of the Scandinavian world through the Viking expeditions and in, in, into which they these lands could start developing something more structured where they could fuel themselves th the market of war because of continuous warfare that happened uh, all, all the time all the time among each other with, with the rest of Europe etc so um, it it's you you find basically these two elements. The one is ideal, the one is structural. The, the ideal one is that there, there is a brotherhood, there is a code of honor, of, of loyalty especially. This idea that you had never to betray the chieftain, etc. Which is typical of the origin. Uh, it's the cliche, the ideal cliché, but it's, it's incidentally what survives also in here into the chivalric tradition. I mean, the idea that once you have sworn um, an oath of allegiance, towards your lord, you have to be uh, blindly faithful, right? From the other side, you have the brutal reality, if you want, of the structure, where you have that these were basically mercenaries. So, in in, in the theory, they, they, they probably were 
and especially at the beginning, very uh, committed to their duty. They, they truly believed that, that, you know, betraying, for example, their chieftain equated to, to, to a total shame and even to to the idea of an ideal death because the, the betrayer that pays that. But they do evolve effectively as mi military retinues, which means that these kingdoms that are being formed they sometimes also fluctuate quite quite a lot because back home in Scandinavia there, there wasn't a, a solid structure. So really the real wealth was based on loot. So the loot naturally can be in very large assets, but it, you, you can't w create a power based only on, on that because that's going to finish. In, in some time, so you need th that's why th this um, chieftains start to invest into a monarchic direction with now other relations, for example, with um, the, the the vassalatic system, with the entrusting of the land in return for military service, for example. So um, it's it's very complicated to explain because paradoxically, the the first system, and 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 and, and then you understand that this structural aspect to evolve towards the feudal chivalric tradition. But what is interesting here is also the concept of the um, how so societies of different levels of development um, and of different possibilities um, function differently. The original idea that, for example, when Tacitus talks about the the Germanic warrior that lost, for example, that fled during battle, right, or or lost the shield, etc., was considered. Uh, he couldn't basically come back to the village because uh, he was worthless at that point. Was considered as nothing. Uh, not even his woman or whoever looked at him in the face because he was already dead, and he, and he had nothing to do but to go hang himself to a tree, right. Um, so it's a bit of odinistic sounding in, in many ways, but this is important to conceive because at that point, aside from from this, the idea is that if you lose your honor, your pride, society uh, basically uh, doesn't consider you anymore. You're ostracized. What? Wha why was it done at that time? Um, it was done at that time because at, at that time those communities had nothing else to survive, literally, than that form of fanatic um, heroism and, and cohesion and allegiance to the group, right? Because there weren't other ways to commit people. There was not enough wealth, say, to pay these troops, to make them become soldiers, right, and to afford them regularly. They, they were warriors with a few collective training, but a great individual emphasis that was supported by this form of ethics so that even if there was no um, centralized power say or superior authority that could impose your training and discipline and therefore making you stay on the field and, and to get butchered down if necessary you were you had the same amount of pressure um, that this society compensated for from from the community right so if you betrayed that bond, you were dead, and you could not, you, you were lost forever for the society. You had nothing to do but to kill yourself. So this, this is important because if you go, in fact, 1,000 years later, now, during the Viking era, you find something very different. You find that that society, it, it doesn't quite function like that anymore. Because there is still a strong metus hostilis for which the societies were intensely militarized by, for example, by continental standards uh, in terms of especially of the world population. But at the same time, th there were other um, factors, other resources, other elements that could be used in order to specialize, militarily speaking. So the Hirt was not now a, a comitatus like all the others. Let's say in Augustian Germany, you could find lots of bands of warriors of, of different extent and naturally they were in competition with each other they had probably a good uh, military average right we know that let's say the germans were considered you know stronger than the Celts uh, at a certain point I mean, th 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 there was this idea that, that the primitiveness of germany made the strength of those peoples individually at least not really collectively but individually but because also they were quite fragmented 
medieval Scandinavia you have something different you have now the herd that is an elite right these guys are not the, the average guy I don't know that wants to join the comitatus for fortune right that there are that there is this as well I mean don't, don't get me wrong there is also some kind of of social mobility in this sense the the, the possibility of, of joining these groups in order to to make a living but this is elite now right this is elite um, that uh, leaves of the spoils of war is equipped by the shift and they're always chorus the troops that they're the elite right then there is the, the ban there is the the the, the levy let's say the, uh, freeman the trip but that has increasingly less capacity right increasing less capacity um, and because they're the freemen are getting poorer society is getting more stratified because these guys from the top now push ver very very hard because they have the power now uh, before nobody had ventured let's say uh, to in order to to create the system to incorporate these markets outside taking the resources from the outside now Scandinavia doesn't have um, the still doesn't have those resources but this this inter uh, very uh, endeavoring chieftains can take it from er elsewhere so this um, completely changes the balance within Scandinavian society and that's where you get stratified and uh, why Vikings I I is bullshit as a thing because it starts it with the idea that you know there was the king that didn't want to make the poor Vikings venturing as freemen outside it's it's completely the other way around so that's another reason why not taking television as 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 a f source of education and I I hope you don't but I, I still think that that show sucks artistically speaking because what you see there are not Vikings of course um, they're just 21st century trash um, but aside from that um, this is a dark story by the way and, and uh, never consider this as you know some sort of uh, whatever but you understand what I mean it, it, it's a dark thing it, 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 it's really it does really pass through violence it does really pass through oppression it, it really does pass through the objectively the loss of freedom it does pass through loss of freedom um, and, and it's a process that substantially happens within Scandinavian society this is important because you know by certain historiographical perspectives you get you know oh, the, the Vikings arrived from the outside and and the one who were hit now it was us like on on the in Central Europe mm, it, it's it's not really like this it, I mean of course Central Europe suffered pretty hard especially certain areas of these things but that was functional to a system that in part also was exported like think about the the, the Normandy uh, you know thing you know the the idea that the Vikings started to settle in various areas they, they started their fortune elsewhere but at the same time uh, this supported broader ambitions think about Knut the, the Great in Denmark I mean that was a pretty freaking massive um, let's say let's call it empire right it, it was fundamentally yes unstable kind of devoid of a structure weak it, it, it vanished as is, it had been formed in many ways but it allowed Denmark for example to to accelerate towards an internal hierarchization right and, and, and that is particularly important because it changes the history of Scandinavia in itself that in the process by the way also gets a acquainted with lots of other models don't think that the Vikings in here were not trying they were, they were something o opposite to the Franks right or the Christian world what these chieftains do is they understand immediately as any intelligent person would do that the, the thing the Franks had invented freaking damned works being a king with vassals with a church is to have an iron fist on the land is to really control it is really to have more power and it's a process of civilization and it's it's tough because civilization does pass through sacrifice you know it does pass through to slaughters and people killed but it, th there is an improvement in the process there is a uh, there is a widening uh, 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 you know uh, an in a comprehension expanding the idea that you can do more complex things 
This is what is starting to happen now. Uh, and the herd, especially, is um, particularly well reconstructable for um, the Dane law, right? The, the most scan. Um, Scandinavized, I don't know how to say, let's say, Normanized, well, I don't know how to call it, Scandinavized part of England, right? Um, you can't find it, but you can find it also in Denmark, as we were saying now. Think about all, for example, the fortified, the entrenched camps of round shape. Think about Trelleborg. Um, these were structures that show exactly that. that there's, they're a sort of reflection of, uh, uh, let's say, of a um, a similar form of encastellation, and these fortified camps were seemingly headquarters for the herd, right? So it was not very different from what we was being done in in the continent, right? With that naturally had way more resources and 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 started this in a much more structured fashion. But these are things you don't find before. The, the the Viking era in Scandinavia, you find this massive, in in fortified camps where the the, the lord would, would would stay with with his military retinue, right? It's not different from the castle with the familia in the in in in, in um, post Carolingian Europe, right? So this is very, very very important. Um. So. Going on, uh, let's see what we can't say now. Well, for example, um, so the herd develops in this form. Uh, eventually, as we were saying before, it gets codified. Uh, we have seen the example of the uh, of the herdeskra, right? Herdeskra. That is this Norwegian law on. Default shot. So, this happens very late. Um, in Latin, they're codified in between 1181, 1182, and they're defined very interestingly as lex. So lex is low, and it's defined now with several adjectives or genitives. Either lex castrensis militaris or curie right these words are very important and they make you understand so much because in the especially in the absence of a um, well defined um, you know of a, of, a of, of previous sources and the fact that the northmen didn't didn't write things down so it's largely a, an oral uh, tradition that is that is lost you find still some um, semantic sh uh, shades in, when in Latin, right? A Latin that often was written by the same the same Scandinavians at this point, right? Th that makes it very interesting because the guy at that point knew what he was writing. At least he had an idea what the 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 ancient, I mean, the, the naturally the, the Scandinavian tongue would define that but had to find a suitable equivalent in latin right and and these terms are very interesting so the lex castrensis basically means the law of the castrum so the castrum would be in fact the the military camp <laughs> what are what did we mention just a few moments ago the entrenched camps of where the herds were so the 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 codification of the uh, of the uh, of the herd system uh, le the legal codification is considered as the law of the entrenched camps just ju of the fortified camp just think about wh what it th how uh, this can be associated to those very things right lex militaris means simply the law of war mm. of the miles I mean, is the, the 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 soldier broadly meant at this point is is something more than the you know miles in Latin is is not truly really the warrior 
because Vir is probably th the warrior or what is should be meant as the let's say the original Indo-European warrior. The Miles is someone who receives a pay for his military service. So here you already understand that the herdman was something different than the average warrior. He was a sort of paid he was a mercenary. Right? He was a soldier proper because he received something, maybe not not necessarily money, but he was paid regularly yeah. by staying under the chieftain. Other term is the lex curia. Now the curia, so curia is genitive, so it means the law of the curia. So the curia is, um, you know, in, in classical Latin it would be basically the, the most ancient political and religious repartition of the Roman people that is in fact attributed to Romulus and we t when you read those stories they're basically all about the the ancient Indo-European thing like of the warriors of this thing in in medieval Latin so here we are by the 12th century so think about the variation of the, the semantic shade is the denomination of certain medieval magistracies that had specifically the mansions of um, surveillance or watch mm -hmm. so basically the lex curiae is the law of those who have to watch to surveil in arms right so these are troops they're not you know a free guy like a free warrior doing what the hell he wants I mean, this is here there is a law that obliges him to perform a, a duty, a military service. And do you realize how close this sounds effectively to vassalatic clientele? This is a big thing. This is a big shift from the original warrior to, to now to what you can start to think like of a knight by the way because these guys are developing also th the myth for example that Vikings didn't use cavalry absolutely false cavalry was dramatically important in Viking warfare um, and, 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 and that has to do even the cavalry does have to do with the professionalization of warfare because it's not a choice uh, staying on horseback means that you have a to pay a freaking amount of, of, of wealth in order to be on that horse and maintaining it and, and fighting knowing how to fight on it and to be equipped adapt. So that means that you, you are not an average person. You're not an average freeman that at best can have just a, a shield and a spear. Because that's what the average is. You are a knight, you're something else. And you belong to the elite in a way or in another. You at least you are under in the retinue of someone who can provide you with those means, and that over time evolves this typical decentralized fashion, a vassalitic system, towards the entrusting of the beneficium that is for military purposes, right? That is, I give you the land, I give you the castle, and for, for from that, that's your prepay. Um, that you need to to field uh, the troops that I need under my command as a king. This is very very important. Um, by the way, the the Hirdskra is composed in. Uh, um, if you're interested in it, because this this was another document, but the Hirdskra was composed between 1274 1277, and and basically translates the relative law that we have seen now in Norwegian vernacular. So, um, if you really want to get lost into linguistical parallelisms, uh, etymologies, semantics, uh, you know, study these things in parallel because they're freaking interesting. So, here we have said it is described the seventies of the thirteenth century. So it's obviously at this point, uh, if you look at Scandinavian warfare, basically realize that aside from yeah maybe some anachronisms compared to the rest of Europe, that it, 
basically the, the, the military system has become feudal, right? You know, now you can't say, well, this is kind of a Northman. These are knights, right? These are knights like you can find in Norway, in fact, you can find in Sicily, or you can find in Portugal, or you can find in Poland. Now, the Frankish culture is spread literally everywhere. It's something big and has modified political and social structures at that point. Um, so, and, and that's where you can find that the ancient warrior spirit is evolved, has evolved, especially through the contact with that properly refined chivalric culture that now had settled in, and was spreading from, even up to Scandinavia, of course, France, uh, Norman England, by the way, Germany. By the way, uh, remember always this, that also we talk about the Anglo-Normans, for example, if you take Norman England, you, you do find that, that there was still a fair um, contact. But, but think about the Viking Age in general. I mean, it's not the Scandinavian northern France are pretty distant, right? And, and one characteristic of these peoples is they actually remembered their, uh, say, Nordic past. This is something you can find since the migration era, is that you find peoples that are defeated I don't know, in Central, Southern Europe, that they are broken to pieces, and what do they do? They go back to Scandinavia, maybe after half of a millennium that they had abandoned it to, to, to descend into these other regions. So just think of how strong it was perceived and how strong the contacts were now, especially in, in high medieval Europe, still within the, the systems, right? I mean, the, the, the Normans, the Nor take the Norwegians, right? The, 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 cruci the Norwegian Crusades. Think about Sigurd of Norway. I mean, there would be nothing strange, for example, to, to feel that they, they would feel very close to, to England or to Sicily, or wh wherever the Normans had created, for example, these own kingdoms. Um, I mean, th there was th still and always this strong contact between all these chunks, right? And uh, th as you know, the Vikings had gone far and wide. They had been hired by the, 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 imperi in the Imperial Guard of Constantinople. They had fought with the Byzantines in Sicily, and then they eventually, uh, one century later, they're sent by the Pope once again to Sicily. Um, and they even created, the, the from Sicily, they, they, they invade uh, I don't know, the Byzantine Empire did create in the Near East the, the Principality of Antioch. Now, this was naturally bringing to a, a massive amount of influence on in these cultures, right? So you can't say these are Vikings, they're Nordmen. It's bullshit. Um, but I it's a synecdoche that, um, that still entails that origin, right? You Think about the Normans, for example, the ones who invaded England and Sicily. Those are not Vikings. Those are properly Franks. Let's be honest about it. Uh, they can be ethnically, in part, descending from the Normans, no doubt, but if, even if you look at their military, they're an I identic, and, and I can't stress, it, uh, stress identic enough, copy of the Frankish military system. They speak French, Old French, whatever it was at the time, uh, but also they're not strictly Norman. They, they're naturally mixed with the Western Franks, but not only. Uh, Anglo-Saxon England is invaded, not just by Normans. There, th th it was plenty, as you know, of Bretons, of Flemish, even, right? Who were the Normans that invaded Sicily? I think it were guys who were waving. I don't know. We were Norwegian or Danish. Those were. It could be literally everyone, but it had joined that kind of cultural lifestyle of military adventurers. Of and it was still pretty alive by the time, by the way, because we were talking about the 11th century, right? You know, uh, we we ideally we think Viking Age finishes in 1066, the Battle of Stamford Bridge, the death of Harald Hardrada, king of Norway, that incidentally had been to Sicily. 
the the Normans there are uh, have already conquered Sicily, for example. So, in, in that case, um, it, it's it's you know if you draw a timeline, theoretically, it's still Viking Age, right? But it, it's still complicated to. But w what I coming back with the focus on Scandinavia, uh, you find that the very strongly and highly refined and sophisticated courtly and chivalric culture spreads. It spreads from the German Minnesänge, for example. Uh, also in here, the, the, all the various sagas, the German epics, now, they were remembered in places like the Rhineland, like in Bavaria. I mean, this was a world that was soaked with, uh, since, not because of the Vikings, but because of the pre-existing at this point, you can say, yeah, Germanic, wh whatever, uh, cultural ideas and models. Think about Dietrich von Bern, they were chanting the Ostrogoths. Um, you know, populations that had effectively come to create these large kingdoms, you know. Um, th there was this memory of the past, it was so white, right, and, and had stressed the, the common origins, if you want. Because there is no reason otherwise to think. Um, I, I always get upset when 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 I realize that people think that uh, that there are so massive differences in in Europe uh, between cultures and how these were perceived. And it, it we should get really at the roots because you can't say well, but the root changed and modified eventually. They it did, but never underestimate what culture can do not genes but culture because because culture is is pretty damn powerful and we have kind of obscured this phase in our memory i don't know why these are things for example in schools are not taught many people would think ah oh, this is kind of a neo nazi stuff you know but, but seriously this is a problem because basically all european medieval culture is about this stuff and even though nobody can deny in absolute terms there were massive influences from elsewhere. For example, even the Muslims had uh, a, a, concept, a concept of of, um, of chivalry. It was based. Uh, it was considered in a bit of a different fashion. In, in the, the term it emphasizes is youth, for example. Then there is all the the Middle Eastern um, feudal, chiefly Persian, Persified ideal that is that is strongly feudal. For example, is, is strongly chivalry the poured into uh, incidentally um some days ago I was making a video on Andalusian um infantrymen during the Umayyad period, right? So we are in the early Middle Ages, roughly the, the Viking era in that context. You can find there were for example military technologies that were shared into Spain um and therefore beyond surely the border of you know let's say Muslims and Christians, because we know that, for example, Iberian warfare uh, doesn't matter w w d this were Christians or Muslims, it was dramatically homogeneous. Um, there were uh, military technological influences like, I don't know, uh, the, the long sleeved male that is typical of the Persian and, and Turkic uh, um, horsemen of, of the Middle East, and you is to be found in Spain, for example, in a moment in which the rest of Europe. The, the average was the short sleeve Holberg, right? Um, um, but the, the Crusaders, uh, there were not excessively many, but were lot, several Crusaders from Scandinavia. And just imagine, uh, but but let's say let's take the Franks in general and their sh chivalric culture and their feudal culture. When they go into the Near East and they meet the Turks that come from this intensely chivalric mindset, right? Because they were horsemen in Central Asia and then they passed through Persia that has this intensely feudal culture. They recognize something into them, right? And this always happens, you know, the, 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 the Christian knight and the Muslim knight recognize there was something in common in there because they share the same testes, the same lifestyle, the same ethics. This is important because it, it, it shows that actually this is not, um, I mean, this is, that even when you talk about the military traditions, these are formed on the base sometimes of very strictly 
practical matters. Like I hope I was demonstrating today. Like why would the comitatus form, right? Um, so because the the structure was imposing it in some measure, right? So you see that different peoples that are not so different at the end of the day do similar things. And what were the Turks, the Seljuks that the the Crusaders were fighting in the Near East? They were steps, uh, steps warriors, just like the Indo-Europeans had been. So you can't say, oh well, yes, but you can't say, you know, there were millennia of different, of, you know, of, of differentiation and different cultures and influences. Yes, there were, but never underestimate, never ever. If you study like the history of since the Bronze Age, it's always been the story of these waves of of cavalrymen coming from the steppes and raiding everywhere. Look at what the Scythians do in the Mesopotamia. Uh, look at what the Indo-Europeans did in into in fact into India or into Europe. Look at what um, eventually the Huns or the the the, 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 the you know the and, and the Turks in the Middle East and all, you know, it, I mean, damn, the steps really did that a lot. And, and it is impressive to see, in many ways, in Europe, but not only, the striking similarities that still are to be found um, in, in the concepts of... of cavalry and chivalry at the same time and the interesting thing is that the more you study military history and the more you realize that the emphasis on these things both ideally and structurally were pretty um, shared because it's easy to think like mechanistically speaking that's what how modern people do like that guy is is intrinsically different from one another and it can learn things only if it kind of l learns it from someone else or at least buys it from steals it or appropriates it from someone else culture is radically different real history is radically different all these things get blended into the cauldron that's why cultural appropriation is nonsense properly historically accurately <laughs> Because it doesn't make a freaking sense, but you still find all these traditions and 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 and, and strong, you know, um, attachment to certain ideals because they are recognized to be some something that goes beyond that has also through which civilization passed. I would say, and never underestimate and never think that civilization cannot pass. For example, through what w you would call a barbarian, because you have no idea. For example, what a you, you're not. Th th I often say you're not more intelligent or more capable than a Bulgar knight of a horseman of, of the seventh century. You are not, and you will never be. Um, and and there is a. L you know what is important is is the commitment. These were people who were dramatically committed. Even the concept of loyalty of the comitatus is something tearing, tearing. It, 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 it's uh, th this was brutal as well. If you entered the comitatus, you had lost your indiv individuality. Now the life, your life, belonged to to the god to to which that comitatus was devoted. Never imagine it. Before it was Odin. After it was God, Christian God, it was the same thing. It's a code of honor that you cannot escape from because you have to have that role, right? Uh, this was seriously brutal. I mean, even the dubbing ceremony, uh, ideally, you know, it was considered as this initiatory rite. You know, the idea that you had to pass through suffering, the slap, for example, to the knight. That was uh, uh, a an echo of the ancient ritual that served in order to enter in the comitatus. You think everyone can enter a comitatus? Hell no. You have to spit blood before entering the comitatus. You have to suffer like hell. You have to stay, uh, to live out there in the wild as much as 
the the calmness proper that the chieftain is pleased with. You can't even die. If you're dead, you chose it, right? And the deity chose it. You were not fit for it. That's brutal. And that's that's crude. That's something, for example, we would never share today. Like because we we are uh, kind of careful in the you know kind of. Uh, but at the time, it was that brutal because because society was that brutal and it wasn't brutal for for sick taste like culturalists believe it was brutal because it, there weren't other ways it could function properly and, and everybody had a place in this context i know it sounds very uh, controversial as a statement but personally the more i read of these things and the more, more i realize it, it it does make sense um at a functional level I mean, it's not a, an opinion. It's not something you could have said, okay, well, now I, I don't care, I will not do it. Because if you lived in a, in a tribal society, it, there is no room for that. There is never room for that. That's why also I hate this modern re, you know, interpretation of certain white supremacists or others that believe that essentially, um, you know, this was were free societies where people were free and free minded. Are you kidding me? Do you, do you realize what 10th century Scandinavia was like, socially speaking? Do you know what what the laws at the time said? Because that's the thing. I realize there is debate, but uh, now I can't digress further because. Uh, but we will do th that that speech about laws because laws are. Yeah, they've been written l down later, but don't think that we can't see the trend of it. The laws of these societies were radically brutal, and I, I really mean it. Uh, they weren't, uh, ah, we are so free and proud and happy and do what we want. Here, if you didn't obey the, what society told you, you were out. And I mean, out forever. Or, or, or um, drawn into a swamp. I think women were free, like they could do when... No, women... Sometimes we... We like to... This is really... Okay, I realize now we can't cover the topic because it's too wide, but it's... Uh, think at, at it in a functional way because the trick that they do, and never let them fool you, is that they make you believe that what we have now is is, is the right thing um you know it, it, it's some there is something that you that you believe it's right okay but that you can't project therefore in the past assuming that that society is equal to yours and someone stole your culture and this other bullshit it, it's never like that if you can you know never never take never let them fool you about this it's not like they wish history is much superior to them because it worked. They do not work. Because they can't say this because they live now. At the time, you didn't have room. Not because there was an evil guy deciding, deciding that d d there wasn't room. But because there wasn't room, literally, for that. So, if we really want to make a you know, general consideration, further general consideration, the the culture of this northern European say thick forests or the misty moors of Scandinavia let's say so, had naturally received um, a you know, far and simplified echo of such chivalric ideals. Never think it was like well you know these were buying immediately that you know it, it went many ways in parallel with the development of f of the feudal monarchies in, in Scandinavia and it was dramatically long right uh, as we were saying before Scandinavian kingdoms start becoming serious powers very late uh, because the ancient models I in a certain sense persisted like it's always the same old problem if you don't have the means take you you can't make a year in order to make a hierarchy to control society you you need to 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 build it with some something if you don't have that something uh it doesn't hold right 
it was a struggle. It was a pretty heavy struggle because just imagine to be a Freeman that you know someone imposes on you. Now you have to follow me because I need your service because I am the, the stronger guy in here. Well, there were warriors who took arms against that. It was insanely conflictual. Um, but on the long run, the comitatus, if you want, wins, right? So the the, the, the there is a even a sort of, of uh, ultimate reward for the herd, right? It's a qualifying role um, because the law based on the herd gives birth to a new aristocracy that is backed by the crown. Um, for example, um, I, I would like to read one prescription that that was about um, the exactly about this of the law uh, the, the the legal codification of, of the here it says uh, beware uh, excuse me uh, uh, beware of robbery and theft adultery and fornication courtesans and gambling free talk and arrogance conceit and greed for another's um, money uh, for someone else's money mercenary and merchant status drinking morning and evening uh, banquets uh, except in that period which is um, for this reason established as a time of common gathering of consensual men right um, from all the seat to um, he uh, who trusts you here it means beware 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 from all the seat to he will trust you from the discourse behind one's back and from speaking well to deceive and from lazing and from all laziness and indolence and from pagan sacrifices and from curses and bad words of every kind this is very interesting because isn't that a chivalric code isn't this courtly edicts it's the same thing uh, very interesting at the at the end that the pagan sacrifices that are the pagan right and therefore the pagan religion in the truest essen essence of it because pagan religion is about rights always remember this it's not about faith it's about right never forget this because if you you don't get this you can't you, you can't tol even speak for paganism in the first place um, is associated to all of this um, if you want very material pleasures right here it talks about obviously um, violence uh, sex uh, drinking um, what does he say here well I mean in, in this general uh, lifestyle without moderation it seems more than else in fact what is is very interesting is here it says you know that there is a time for all this technically so you should you know here evidently um, this society I mean just like in courtly love do you think that there was ever a time in which knights were you know like uh, talking to the mademoiselle and at the top of the towers and waiting for them so platonically it's a, it was uh, the world was always been what it's always been um, uh, here what is interesting in this codification it says you know try to basically reduce all of this material aspect just for <laughs> you know the time that is is uh, consensually defined right and it's interesting because it it really codifies it I mean there, there is really a standard for which you should obey to that a rule to that level of um, you know of moderation that is asked to you naturally uh, here this is Scandinavia maybe somewhere else um, certain activities were let's say banned um, in, in the first place but in theory ideally as we were saying before so it's obvious that the North has still a very long persistence of <laughs> a certain lifestyle right? so um, but it's obvious that such human precepts um, equilibrated human precepts um, 
are already filtered through courtly culture, right? And you might say, well, so wha what then? What then is that, um, when did it start? You might say, um, <laughs> because if we go back, you know, um, a, a little bit, we can find already in some Anglo-Saxon poems um, something like this. Uh, this is uh, quoted, for example, from the errant. These are Anglo-Saxon poems, and and it says uh, exactly the same. The sage must be patient. He must not be too passionate or too bold with words. Neither the warrior must be weak nor too reckless, neither fearful nor too exalted, nor too greedy of riches, nor too proud indeed before time. A man has to wait a moment before abandoning himself to words of pride until he is sure in his pride of what the ultimate goal is to which thought um, tends. Right? This is very interesting because it shows that uh, this, uh, this poem belongs to the still pagan age of the Anglo-Saxons, right? Um, very ancient. So what you find here is the proof, though, that something that chivalry was built upon was not an external influence, was not something unknown. It, it came from that same pagan past in part in part it, it naturally was uh somehow somewhat different uh, but these principles of moderations were evidently clear and and functional to to a healthy society right the sage for example the, the wise man always remembered that since the the pagan let's say the ancient pagan world, the chief thing is not just the bravest of warriors, it's also the wisest of warriors. This is a Clausewitzian concept, guys, that's why we make uh, lessons about von Clausewitz. Uh, the chief thing is not, you know, the the young one, the new, uh, the new element of the comitatus that has still everything to prove is to be all about courage, right? It was usually the young, uh, the youth skirmishing in front of the lines of the gr uh, of of the heavier and older warriors that had to prove with the evolutions and acrobacies in front of the enemy lines to to have guts and to be worth of belonging to the comitatus. But the more you you rose up to the top, well, the chieftain has to be chiefly an intelligent person, and it couldn't be otherwise. So this is von Clausewitz in a nutshell, really. And it proves you how, in every society, war works exactly in the same way. And here it says, actually, very interesting things, because it says the, 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 the sage um, has to be patient. So he doesn't have to be hot-headed, right? And that is pretty damn important into, into a war. It doesn't have to be too passionate. Not to bolt with words, because words here are politics, right? So they can lead to war, theoretically. So it has to be very thoughtful and considerate. And then it says the warrior, right? It talks about the warrior. Remember always, this is an, a pagan Anglo-Saxon um, poem. It says the, the warrior uh, doesn't have to be nor weak, nor too bold, actually. It doesn't have to be too fearful, nor too exultant. Doesn't have to be too avid of riches, nor true, too pride before time. So here is I identifying, even into the warrior, in the average warrior, this need of, of balance, right? And this is very civile, conceptually. This is very thoughtful and considerate. So even well, naturally, Anglo-Saxon society has a lot of um, 
let's say it's a bit different from Scandinavia as you understand but it was still soaked into this ideal of a warrior because whatever the the origins let's say of what we call Anglo-Saxon England are naturally they were kind of composite because they weren't just the Anglo-Saxons were the poor youths were <laughs> somewhere else too somewhere there too I mean but there was the the romano britannic stratus there were the Celts so also in here but th these were shared thoughts of a of a society that um, that deemed that this models of of let's say political and military models based on the shift and, and of the comitatus were fine um, but um, think about the Thanes and all but think out how strong that that ethics really was and we will quote now bad the, the venerable in a while now because that's where we think about the the flight of the sparrow you know and, and uh, this typically um, kind of typical comitatus right at the time um, but you already find in in that society that the Christians were trying to, to Christianize completely now that kind of moderation right um, and um, and even here pride here he says it touches the pride that was like the first thing you know the the Germanic ethics uh, this idea that nobody could could insult you because it was a matter of a honor it was like the mafia like literally the same thing um, because it, they are literally the same thing historically speaking uh, and the, the, the here says doesn't you know yeah be proud but only when you know that you're right essentially so be sure that your proud is rightful this was a pagan thought in Anglo-Saxon pre-Christian Anglo-Saxon uh, society that is particularly particularly important so this helegy that we have read belongs to um, to to an environment that as, as we've seen is uh, at least superficially Christianized but the the heroes of of bathe the, the venerable for example in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle have already chivalric gestures uh, so even in even the Christian perspective obviously knew Bent was obviously an Anglo-Saxon so he knew what that society was about and he recognized to them this kind of you know of goodness that existed within the warrior traditionally uh, in some warriors and especially the ones of the retinues the ones th they had to prove to be faithful to the chieftain in other words the ones would become would become elsewhere as the Oscars of the Earthmen right you know those men would would become in turn aristocracy at the end of this period like with the Salatic system so yeah we, we're kind of switching centuries in here but still that's the path and, and still those figures had an important character it's interesting because you see even before the Anglo-Saxons uh, in uh, in Britain I find that this for example was present among the Celts right even the, the the hell even the Romans had this in, in still in imperial times I mean it, it belonged to that tribal cultural the beginnings that praised the idea of the warrior of the freeman as, as someone who was virt properly virtuous I made a video uh, relatively to this that is uh, about the Indo-European sacred fury in which I stressed the, the analogies that existed in fact between societies that we often s think oh like this were the Romans were something radically different from the Celts no no they were dramatically close they were cousins um, but at best um, so it's uh, quoting for example from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle um, there is for example in for, for 626 uh, Lilla, who um, here I think I have uh, the, the quote basically protects with his own body the um, the king 
his own king and dying by receiving this blow that was destined to the king here I can quote even Anglo-Saxon Chronicle year 626 this year Ilmer came from Cuchel king of we uh, the West Saxons thinking to stop King Edwin but he stabbed Lilla his thane and forth he here uh, envoded the king right so this is damn important you you find it in every kind of Germanic society you, you find this uh, but I, I would like to stress in here that it's not just about being Germanic it's it's about a, a cultural model I mean this idea that the chieftain had to to go around with an armored dragon is something you find literally all over Europe at this point you find it in the, in the, you know, among the Franks with the Antrustiones you find it uh, in Longobard Italy um, you find it literally every, you find it even among the Slavs of course because they came too from the same thing so these were worlds that were capable of communicating with each other through this shared um, appreciative cultural mores the Roman and Germanic kingdoms stressed incredibly a lot the, um, the common origins they, they were in constant contact with each other Anglo-Saxon England for example I don't know too had lots of contacts with Longobard Italy um, the, the, the Anglo-Saxon chronicles remembered um, even the, excuse me as Norris Sturluson remembered still later on Albevin is a great uh, king of the Longobards this great um, they were all remembering to have been part of, of the same thing and and these were the models right like Lilla uh, or Edwin for example that knowing that uh, for example the noble friend that hosts him is about to betray him he refuses um, to to counter him because he considered the nobility and the good that his host had already uh, made to him at the point that uh, it would have it, it would have not been right to betray him in, in turn so this uh, this is important because beyond the ideal there's a beautiful book from Mozelewski that is European um, Barbar uh, barbaric Europe or U Europe of the barbarians that, that, that explains this beyond the literal uh, liter obviously bed the venerable is writing for edifying reasons right but here it's not a uh, it's obviously an embellishment but beyond it there, there is much else there is the need to to regulate a society that evidently doesn't have a firm center because it's, it's ruled exactly by think about the Anglo-Saxon heptarchy and the mess that it was um, or el all these various chieftains basically that that had that were quarreling uh, among each other etc but that had to find uh, an equilibrium a political and social equilibrium in order to 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 leave to to lead the political a military life it couldn't be chaos these chieftains were trying to create already at this time as early as this time a functional society a society that could organize itself it could keep itself together right and and, and this as we showed in here with um, was part of the comitatus was part of and, and, and all the law the this loyalty that was at the base of it right the, the loyalty was everything when for example when the uh, the Carolingians conquered Saxony they they had naturally the problem of Christianizing the Saxons forcefully and another problem is that the Saxons didn't understand not just Christian religion at the beginning but also and especially the forms of Christian religion the Bible the book the written culture right they had difficulties they couldn't read they were illiterate in order to make them understand they were telling the story of the Gospels in a way like Jesus like the chieftain and the Apostles like the t <laughs> you know the the the, the retinue right when when Saint Peter cuts off the guards that are coming to to arrest Jesus uh, in the um, let's say 
the, the Saxon version of the story was fabricated for, for converting the Saxons. There was this enormous emphasis on the blood, right? On this idea of really the, making them think that, and also this thing that the Jesus, as you know, St. Peter betrays Jesus. Um, and um, he renegades, he, yeah, he betrays him morally in the sense that he renegades him, he, he doesn't recognize him. Um, and, and, and in order to make the Saxons understand the desperation that would derive um, from betraying a chieftain, like betraying Jesus, which was, was like betraying a chieftain, they were making them think that Jesus was the chieftain of all the world, like, and, and that you had to swear allegiance to him, just like this military retinues did, because it was the only s way to keep society together, because, and, and that's how morally, um, um, let's say, challenging and, uh, and committing such bonds were, right? Uh, the idea of lying, theoretically, in, in the ancient Aryan ideal, if you take the 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 uh, Persian, you know, the the glory of the, the celestial glory of the sky couldn't fall upon men if they said a lie, for example. Uh, you know that I in the Indo-Aryan world, you you basically uh, Humans do not have the glory. It's it's the is the celestial deity of the sky that gives glory to them. That's why the Romans, when they, they made the triumph, they they basically brought back the glory to the the uh, the, the temple of of Jupiter Capitolinus because they were rendering back the glory coming from the sky to the skies with a sacrifice. And during the triumph, the general was the only moment in which could look like a god because he was bringing back that glory. And it was a guy be behind, the, you know, on the chariot behind him, whispering in his ears, "Remember that you're just a man. Never think that the glory belongs to th to you as a man, because it's only because of the gods." Do you understand how deep these concepts are, and how? R r deeply rooted were in this society, right? Um, the, the entire idea of the Comitatus is that it was a Gefolgschaft. It was a retinue of warriors committed to a chieftain that in this sense was not the chieftain. I mean, in the secular world, of course it was, but in earthly affairs it was, and that's why he had to be wise and all, like all the, the here the Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, Helgi was telling, but he has to be so because that's the only way he can get the glory from the sky. So basically, you follow the chieftain as long as he wins. As he doesn't win, it means that he has screwed up. He has done something that has basically insulted the deity and that has abandoned him. So another chieftain could rise. So that's also why he's so dramatically unstable. Such military groups really were because at the end of the day they they didn't have any other mean to maintain cohesion than the effectiveness of the commander I, in a world without a state what do you obey to you obey to who be bears arms but we know that the military needs a hierarchy to work and and the hierarchy is is, is the most decisive uh, the most determinant factor in in the ter in in, in in the outcome of, of warfare, right? So you invest your life, let's say, by entering into the retinue of someone you presume is going to win. That's also why during the Viking Age it was really about this, because the victorious commander could, uh, uh, that would win, would make a lot of loot, right? Would uh, sum up, uh, would gather a, a, an enormous loot, uh, booty that everybody would get a piece of by committing themselves to follow that king, that chieftain. So, and and uh, and that's why they were sworn an oath of the, of allegiance, and why this was so important. Because you would say, well, it was just an oath of allegiance; it's not important. It was important because if you broke the oath of alle allegiance, you didn't insult the, the chieftain; you insulted the whole society and the deity. 
So you could have not gotten victory because you were inherently a, a cowardly, a betrayer. That's how they reasoned. And that's how these things were kept together, right? Even ideally speaking, you know, um, it, it was structural and ideal at the same time. They, they compenetrated each other. So towards the end of the Viking Age, you have something that goes beyond this, that surpasses this, this thing, because society has grown more complex than that. So you can achieve that through other ways that to which you need, for example, the, the homage, the, the, you know, the, the old uh, fealty and all this stuff that belongs naturally to the, to the vassalatic uh, beneficiary uh, system. But, you know, um, it's, it's fairly more uh, secularized, right? It's obvious that a Viking of, let's say, the late 8th century was way, but way less secularized than a Viking of the second half of the 11th century, right? It, it lived in a world that was still uh, extremely, uh, you know, mysterious, foggy, um, irrational by certain standards. Like, the, the ancient paganism was, was based on, on this fe idea of feeling, feeling strongly, having this um, even ultrasensorial experiences, this perception of the, the forces of the spirits and the mysteries of, of, of nature, of the world. Like when, for example, never think the pagans had, had a pantheon, right? The, the figures like Odin ha were kind of, a, of a, um, an essence, a, a presence uh, that also had several different, uh, you know, affiliations like branches like in the in reality that could be spotted into signs uh, in nature i mean it, it was very it's way beyond we, we can't understand it anymore it, it's useless um it's not like you know taking a trip in, in the forest and pretending to to be a viking of the eighth century you know, it, you, you we have completely lost that ability uh, but already a uh, Viking of the second half of the 11th century was way about different mindset. He had seen way more than that. He had known way more than that. And he had thought, ma had rationalized way more than that. So even the, the following edicts um, is, and, and, and in many ways the reasons why it was also put, written down, and that makes this a, a the a stage in the path of the evolution of society is properly that um, until societies, this, this Scandinavian societies were too primitive, that they didn't need to write. So when they start to write, it's because their society needs it. Right? Do you think you adopt scriptures just because you learn it from someone else? You don't understand really how technology works and wh why is that we use things and what for. Uh, if you have a society that doesn't have to account too much surplus and organize it to redistribute it, wh what do you need writing for exactly? You can do it all well with your mind. So this goes far beyond and, and makes it able to makes your mind more rational in some ways. It, it, it's required from you something that now from your mind that is to adapt to the means at your disposal. That's why being, uh, you know, uh, let's say uh, a 7th century Germanic warrior of a comitatus was, you know, uh, if you want a much more emotional, less rational world than it was to be a, a 12th century uh, Swedish uh, a knight uh, holding a uh, beneficium and you know having to, to deal with it and being framed into a much larger political um, uh, spectrum. I mean, that's the passage of of civilization that that you find within this. And I don't know if you get it, but it's particularly important. So to conclude um, with a further reflection, I'd say that it, it would certainly be, uh, it would have certainly been actually a, a very tough, uh, long, 
and I must say not always successful endeavor to transform the warriors of the Moors and the Fjords in, into into knights, right? Uh, to I mean to erase from their soul the the, the memory of this ancient um, fury of of Vulcan, right? Um, when we quoted the Hirtzkra before, we have uh, seen how the the various prohibitions from the various prohibitions in that sense, how strong was still during the 13th century the the empire of the Lord uh, of the Lord of the Dead, right? You know the Odinic fury and and this emotionalism that that was needed for the individual value of a warrior now but uh, was still very alive still very alive but now something kicks in more you can't just be hot tempered if you are a 12th century knight you have to calculate you have to stay within the ranks of the formation because otherwise the whole cavalry charge gets screwed up. You have to know your horse. You have to spend years, years of training, of continuous training. You have to rationalize it. You have to skill yourself into techniques that before were were equally demanding in some ways, but now they were bent to a much more complex system. How can you have Vodans Furar and in the moment in which you have to decide in a very extremely delicate moment in which you have to decide wh when to launch a cavalry charge because if you if you wait too long or or if you are you're too you you do it too early you can make the whole thing fail and you die right you you can't live in a war like this in a warfare like this with that ancient idea and believe me, uh, excuse me, believe me, but it, ta it does take a lot, a real lot. There are s civilizations that took really centuries to frame um, the mindset of a warrior in the one of a soldier. Uh, the Romans took centuries before transforming an Italic warrior into a Roman legionnaire. Um, equally, it took a lot to transform a, uh, a Germanic um, warband warrior um, into a into an, a feudal knight, and it really a lot, really a lot. However, uh, without doubt, either the transformation. This is what I would like to stress today, is that the transformation of the warriors into knights could happen in the first place because between these two dimensions there weren't objectively qualitative diversities nor um, real discontinuity, but I would say more a cultural choice, a different direction to follow, right? So you don't change because all of a sudden you see another model, you you copy it and it works. It never works that way. It's the same model that, that evolves on by the way, true um pathways that that sometimes are very, very um indistinguishable, right? You you can't you know like in this case, if this ancient violence that we have described will survive to this cultural choice, if um, the Christian knights will behave like berserker, because it will happen. Uh, you could argue that it still happens. You, ha you have to bear in mind that even this um, uh, pafo, let's say, or um, let's say, uh, lapses of style um, into the ancestral state do belong rightfully to the history of, of, of chivalry because uh, to pretend that, that chivalry is something substantially different 
from the pre-existing military address. The Indo-European address is wrong. It is wrong. These are the pillars, if you want, on which the same chivalry was developed in the first place, right? Never, I mean, the, the, there is a, an, um, sometimes here uh, at a didactical level an ambiguity of perspective. Um, when you consider Scandinavia, first of all, as a sort of, you know, good savage world where, you know, all of this, uh, uh, this you know, this Frankish and Christian models arrive and everything changes. No, the, as we've seen, that took centuries to happen. But especially, it was an external influence that, that didn't, you know, that, that somehow uh, was uh, imposed fr from the top. It was something that entered deep into the veins of Scandinavia and flourished, right? Like it had happened for the other populations. That's how the feudal and chivalric culture merges in there too. It's not an export, right? Now, in the 21st century, we, 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 we reason like, you know, there is a kind of a third world country, and, uh, um, and therefore, if you give them this technology and that technology, all of the in, in, in a few years, they will start building skys uh, skyscrapers and, uh, and everything, and it will be, like, uh, fine. No, no. Cultural transitions do not happen in this way. They take time. They, they need time. Because if you don't have a fertile ground, you can't build upon it. So cultural changes are always progressive, always gradual, uh, and they have to 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 take place on a permeated stratum that already knows how to absorb the new influences and how to make them develop. And in this sense, um, it's even sort of. Um, it's wrong to, to perceive that there is a society that, it, that is superior uh, in, the, uh, in the objective sense of the world. Th there is no superiority or inferiority because I in order if you to, to spot these, you have to take a standard. Now this standard could be different because how can you tell to, to a 10th century uh, Viking that then in 200 years th his homeland would have become a kind of a feudal kingdom. He would have been destroyed and he would have said how? The culture I have now is the one I feel, it's mine, it's my beliefs, my 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 customs, my, my reason if you if you want. I, it, it, it's impossible to think of how what they would have used as a term. He would have not been able to accept it. It would have taken in fact hundreds of years for that uh, thing to, to to be accomplished. And it's only in the 13th century, objectively, that uh, Scandinavia kind of um, uh, feels that this, this, this gap that it had existed with the rest of Central Europe um, and becomes now, you know, if you take 15th century Europe, basically can't distinguish anymore, nor techniques, nor uh, certain values, yes, objectively, because um, there are different cultures, but everything gets blended much more quickly, right? So, um, so yeah, right. And um, uh, I don't know what what you think about this this video because it's uh, I think I, I said w way more things than than I actually intended to but I, I still think it's important to to take the to understand the longer perspective like the the, the mm, if we stop to talk about the single thing the single guy um, the single year we lack all of the we 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 lose all of this and and uh, and yet and and we can't we can't afford it I I, I think we can't afford it as a civilization. We can't afford it because um, if you don't have this longer perspective, you can't understand how, what what you can do at a sh in in a short period of time. Which is a period, uh, excuse me, is a, is a problem that maybe like a 10th century Scandinavian warrior would have not posed himself because he thought that the world probably was kind of stationary in some form. 
um, uh, in our world we have much more accelerated rates um, and we um, we know how dramatic can be evolutions and changes and how we need to catch up how we how to solve the problems that present as always larger and always more challenging right now we think we have made it to the top we haven't made it to the top now we have huge responsibilities more that world was was much more intelligible in many ways uh, that's why also partly it changed so easily by certain standards or I, I, I explain myself better um, uh, if you remember at the beginning of the video we said that in spite of all, all the time it took still the change was simple like that there haven't been multiple directions well today it's not like this anymore it takes less to change and the change can lead to very uh, very dif diversified range of, of outcomes and it's dangerous so looking at these societies in perspective is useful because we can learn so much from that and um, to be aware of what our our options are today All right okay so um, for today we stop here and I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.